here. <laughs> oh my gosh. I have <laughs> questions for you. But let me say, let me start by saying this. Do you believe the sky is the limit to what you can have and accomplish? Our next guest, known as the Dragon Lady, believe that and some of the and, and some, same as the first black woman to she's the first black woman to fly the United States Air Force's U-2 spy plane used for specialized high altitude reconnaissance missions. She is also the author of her book titled Shattered the Sky, an inspirational memoir that shares her life lessons on everything from her career in the military, which is available on Amazon. And I, is it audible too? I don't know yet. Um, but, it is not audible. Okay. Is it your voice? It is my voice. Oh, that's pretty dope. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen and non-binary alike, welcome to the show, veteran, motivational speaker, and author, Meryl Pangasgott. Oh. She was there. Did it say she left? Listen, they they don't they don't teleport her out of here. What happened? I get, I think the the FBI found. Oh, she... oh, don't know where. Oh God, the FBI came. We're gonna get her back. You guys hang tight. <laughs> Listen, I've been getting calls. Okay. I have to ask her. Okay, there she is. She's coming back. Um, it's been really weird lately. I don't know what's going on. Wait, what? I think that I think that the government knows you're going to talk to us, and <laughs> they have come because I've been getting calls from first of all from Iran. I got a call last week from Iran. You did. I don't know why. And I also got a call from, I think, it could have been North Korea. So one, it was an Asian country. And I was like, what the hell is going on? I, what, come on, tell us, like, let's tell tell everyone your true background. Because if you get calls from there, something else is going on. Listen, I may need to uh, get off this show. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, hello, Meryl. Welcome to the show. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself for those that may not know who you are? Yeah. So my name is Meryl Tengasol. I'm a retired colonel, 23 years in the military, both the Navy and the Air Force. Um, I was a pilot by trade. I've flown everything from helicopters. I was a fixed wing instructor. And then my last aircraft was the U-2 Dragon Lady. That's why I have Dragon Lady. Um, 788 was my pilot number, and I've also uh, been an instructor in the T-38, which is a uh, supersonic tra uh, fighter trainer jet, T-6, for primary students that just start out. And so that's what I am. I, I did that for 23 years. I retired as a colonel, and then I went on to do a reality show called Tough as Nails, got picked up for that, um, which was a great experience. I'm a mother of two. And, uh, you know, I have two amazing kids. Uh, one is soon to be 11. One's going to be nine, a uh, boy and a girl, respectively. And, yeah, just doing my thing, having fun, um, living life, motivating people. I do motivational speaking and um, just trying to share my story with people, young girl from the Bronx, and trying to inspire people. Now, wait, so you said your pilot number was 718? 788. So that's why I'm Dragon Lady 788. You know what 718 is. Um, right. Yes. Yes. Eric. So, um, Meryl, just like me, you grew up in the Bronx, um, New York. And I know for me, being there, um, growing up in the Bronx just has a way of making you ambitious and driven. Could you tell us what it was like for you growing up? And do you feel that um, how you may have grew up or where are you from attributes to to all that you've accomplished. So, so um, what part of the what part of uh, the Bronx were you from? The Morrisania area, um, not far That's from the uh, Yankee Stadium and all that. Yeah. All right. So I grew up in Co-op City, born and raised. So uh, yeah, I know Co-op City. I've been there several times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when I was growing up back in the day, back in the seventies primarily uh, black and Jewish growing up. I just remember people speaking Yiddish. I just remember it was like that big 
you know, the village raised kids. Like you couldn't be a kid out there and do something and not and get back to your, your parents or your mom or anything. And so I think for me, it was, uh, you know, growing up in New York, I mean, if you, like they say, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Like my mom didn't mess around. Um, she was just, you know, my grandmother was from the West Indies. She was from uh, St. Thomas. Um, on my dad's side, they're all from Trinidad. So, I mean, it was just one of those things that, you know, growing up in the Bronx, you had this diverse group of people. Um, most people think New Yorkers are rude, but we're, we're not. We're just very blunt, very straightforward. We don't, we don't mess around. And you have to be a strong and this strong individual just to be who you are growing up in that area. So I think that helped out quite a bit because, uh, you know, it just made you more confident, more assertive, and just more true to who you are. Right. And you got some fans in the comments. Um, Bad Dog says she flew helicopters in the Navy, which meant she had to land them on ships that were sloshing around in the ocean yes. and had the unstable landing pads. Now, I mean, growing up in the Bronx, would you have even imagined that that's something that you would become a spy? Uh, you know, I, I always wanted to be. So when I was seven years old, I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. So at that age, I just said, let me have this framework in my head. I use Star Trek as that framework. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to go to school. I want to be a pilot. And then I started on that journey. So um, I was really into some a lot of STEM programs, a lot of reading. And it led me to getting going to the University of New Haven, get my degree in electrical engineering, and then moving on from there. So I joined the military with the purpose as I wanted to be a pilot. In the beginning, when I was searching, I couldn't, um, they, they were saying, ah, oh, the recruiters were like, we don't, we don't need pilots. We don't need pilots. But I kept going at it until finally, um, someone was dating who said they Oh, strange, <laughs> strange, my dark heart. Love the girl. Um, you know, basically, uh, they said, if you come out to San Diego and you pass the test, we'll get you a pilot slot. So that's what I did. So in a sense, you always knew who you were going to be. You just didn't know how you were going to get there. I did, you know. So I had this idea in my head. I was like, I'm going to be an astronaut. Here's these things that were based off of Star Trek. I knew I had to go to college. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to fly, but I wasn't sure. But as I kept going down, as I got older, more of that path became apparent to me. Because you can't do anything if you're just dreaming and you're not taking the steps to move forward. So that's what, I mean, that's really the thing that you have to do. And then once you do that, I believe that options start opening up for you. If you make yourself available and you start walking down the path, that is, you know, that's what's going to happen. And and it might take you somewhere different, but you have to start walking on that path. That's awesome. Well, Meryl, um, you served in the United States Air Force and Navy from 94 to 2017. What yes. made you decide to join the service? And what was your experience like as a Black woman in the service? Yes, I, jo I joined the service, one of the reasons why I wanted to fly. But I will tell you, to be honest, if I didn't get a pilot slot, I would have probably joined the military for at least four years. Because for me, I wanted to serve um, just in something bigger than myself. I wanted to serve in some capacity and help uh, this country. You know, right now, we said we're not going to talk about politics, but geopolitically, there's a lot of things going on in the world. And I will tell you that whether you hate this country or you're upset with it and there's a lot of things going on, it's still there's a lot of other places that you we don't want to be at this time. So I'm kind of proud to be where I'm at. We are we have our faults. We make our mistakes, but we try to fix them. And there are a lot of good people in this country that want to see other people grow and do good things. So I felt at that age, I was like, man, I, I got to spend a couple of years in the military and serve. And so with that, joining the military as a black female, you know, when I first started flight school, I had to deal with people who were flying in, you know, the Vietnam era, uh, you know, the Korean era. And there's people there, you know, there was a push in the Navy because I started out in the Navy flying for minorities and when there's a push like that you know there are people who are happy that you're there some people don't care as long as you can perform and there's other people who may not particularly think you're there because you're on your own merits 
And my first um, instructor, who was a white male, him and I, we would talk about this all the time. And, you know, he basically told me, you know, when, Meryl, when you're going to walk into a room in the military, a lot of people are going to think things about you when they see you. They're going to think you're there because you're black, because you're female, because whatever. He said, but if you perform like you perform in flight school, and he was like, you're one of the best pilots I've ever flown with, they're going to say that you're there because you're that damn good. Right. And so I take that with me. You know, people are always going to have these perceptions about you. I don't care, you know, what gender, um, you know, what ethnicity you come from you walk into a room and you're the only one people are going to have these opinions about you and you have to be able to perform and rise above that and just keep performing until they say you're there because you're that good believe me there are going to be people in the room that are aligned with you that walk in the same direction as you and want to help you so you have to find those people and you know, get connected with those people. And the other people they're going to talk about you regardless but eventually they're going to talk behind your back because they're so wrapped up and looking at you, that they're just going to watch you walk on by and continue climbing the ladder. So that's how I feel about it. Did that fuel you to prove people wrong? Because I know for me, Absolutely. I feel like yeah. someone is doubting me. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to show you. Uh, Did that kind of fuel you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, doubt, I like to be, <laughs> I like to be underestimated a little bit because that is, you know, that's, all right, you're going to underestimate me, I'll show you. I mean, it's sometimes that is the fuel to the fire in some of the, like you have your desires and your passions, but sometimes, you know, sometimes a hater could fuel you just a little bit. So, you know, I don't, you know, I use that um, positively. I don't use it as something to get me down. I'm just like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll show those doubters. So, yes, it happens, and I think it happens to all of us. Um, I think it happens to, you know, as a, as a woman in a male dominated field, it happens a lot. So that's, um, that's, that's the mindset I have. Don't get me wrong. In the beginning, you know, you have your doubts about yourself. You have that imposter syndrome where you think you're not, you're not meant to be there. But I mean, it took an instructor. My first instructor was a white male to tell me that, to, to say that. So to me, it's like, I never looked at it as, um, a black or white thing or male female thing. I looked at it, people aligned with me because going through the military, even when I retired, there were not a lot of people when I sat at the table that looked at me, like me. So you have to align yourself with the people that walk in the same direction with you. Yeah. I mean, and I, I definitely respect that. It's always funny to me, like when people say about like, um, I guess affirmative action, but you know, I think that those things are put in place because it gives a chance for people who look like us to actually even get in the door when usually the door is closed. So I'm I'm happy that you know you were able to not only kick the door in but like you know fucking seal it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so I I look at it growing up in the 70s and 80s when I I had some mentors and there was one lady who was an educator. And she gave my mom a copy of this book that had all these STEM programs in it. Mm. And they were for, they were for just pick a program. Some of it was for, you know, kids of color or girls or kids of a certain age. And I think at that time, it was about just having the opportunity to be able to apply to it. I, I think most people don't understand, even in the military, there is a minimum requirement that you must get to, to be able to. Um, promote mm. to be able to get certain jobs. It's it's not a, a gender or color thing. We all have a minimum requirement that we have to do. And if they see a whole bunch of people rack and stack and we're all very equal and we're all, all doing the same thing and they say, well, I represent a bigger group and they pick me because of that. Well, don't get mad at me. Like, seriously, I made the minimum requirement. The reason why I made it to Colonel wasn't because it was a diversity push is because I worked my butt off and I have all the criteria. I was a commander. I worked at the staff job. I did all these other things. What did you do? <laughs> Except look at me and say, oh, she got it. Uh, well, tough. I worked my butt off. Yeah. <laughs> you deserve and a lot of those. They also get put because of their legacies. So I don't know. You know, people don't think about that. 
But um, let me ask you this. Uh, in, t- in 2021, speaking of competition, by the way, because you are a fierce competitor, and not many people can go up against you, period. Um, you were a competitor on the second season of the CBS reality shows, Tough As Nails, on the, t- uh, the team Savage Crew. Tell us how was that experience and what did you learn from it? Oh, man. Um, that was uh, an amazing experience. It was it was this unexpected opportunity that happened during COVID when I was first getting on social media after retirement. I posted a video of me dancing and a producer reached out to me. And uh, she was dancing. like, we would love for you. Say again? You must have been dancing real quick. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a bad dancer. Well, I've I'm seen some of, your, um, some of your videos on Instagram with you dancing. There was one with your husband and it was one, I don't know what you were doing, but you were getting it. So... <laughs> Yeah, we saw a video last night, and I was like, oh, shit. Oh, I, like, I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, yeah, I was dancing, and they reached out because uh, the producer saw my saw the video, and then she started researching who I was, and she's like, oh, my goodness. And uh, so they said, hey, we are looking for veterans for the show. Mm. And I said, um, okay, uh, yeah, I'm interested. So I... I applied, interviewed, kept interviewing, and made it to the final and made it on the show. So they take 12 people from all these, uh, the, the trades. So your mason workers, your welders, your your veterans. Um, on our show, we had uh, a nurse, a travel nurse. And then we compete as teams and as individuals. So on Savage Crew, we were on Savage Crew, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, we had a supervisor. Um, a welder, a steel worker, and a nurse. And we were the most eclectic group of people. And I'm a pilot running around, and we're just, we're killing it. We're just doing really well. I mean, we had these ups and downs, but we persevered at the end. So it was, it was amazing. I met these great people that I call my brothers and sisters now, and we still keep in contact. I mean, we'll be friends for life. So it was just really, it, it was a great experience. That's awesome. Um, in 2021, you released your memoir titled Shatter the Sky, where you discuss the beginning of your life growing up in the Bronx to your life and your lessons you've learned while being in the military. Why was this book important to you to release and why, what inspired you to do so? Yeah, it was important for me. Um, this came on the heels of the show. It was, um, look, if if you get this opportunity, where you're going to be on a reality show um to me when they when they called for me and i started making the interview process in my mind i was like look i, I want to tell my story and thank you uh strange mind dark heart um i wanted to inspire people i wanted to inspire kids that were growing up in the bronx growing up in underserved communities that it doesn't matter what you look like it doesn't matter um your background that just makes you more unique and that makes you more ready and prepared to take on the challenges. You just need that opportunity. And so that's why I wrote this. I wrote this book really just to talk about my life, the ups and downs. I wanted to be an astronaut. I didn't make it to be an astronaut, but dang, I had such this right now I'm having this amazing journey. And I wanted to show people that you can have these dreams. You can go forward to it. You can make it. I made it just almost to the top. I still got a lot of life left, so you'll never know, or you will know eventually. <laughs> and then, you know how how you how you navigate life and some of the difficulties being in the military as a a woman of color and being in an officer position. There are some challenges. There are some leadership challenges. There are some personal challenges. And how do you navigate these things? So it's all about. Um, talking about my lessons learned and my life lessons for people to take forward with them to help them on their own journey. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I've heard oftentimes, a lot of times, when people write memoirs um, about their sales, that um, it really, really takes them back. And it also helps them remember things that they may have forgotten, um, you know, in their past. Um, was this like, was that, was, did you have the same experience and was it therapeutic for you writing this? I, yes. So I would say it was stressful for me because there were a lot of things that I had forgotten and there were, there were a lot of things that I had written about. 
um, in my journals and stuff. And I pulled all that stuff out and it just brought back a whole bunch of memories. So mm. it was cathartic in a way. Um, but I, I wanted to keep it honest. So I was pulling out all sorts of stuff. I was pulling out yearbooks and just reading stuff and just remembering and going back. So it, it was good to, to walk my life. Cause it kind of, it kind of, Kind of humbled me because there's a sometimes you get to this point and you're like, oh, I'm um, the first and only woman to fly, black woman to fly to you, too. And then you're like, oh, man, as a teenager, I was a pain in the ass. So, like, I, <laughs> you know, oh, I tried to glue the locks to the school. I was one of these jerks, too. So when I see my kids do stuff, I go, oh, yep, yep, I did that, too. So, right. <laughs> um, if they did, because like you said, you know, you you're retired and whatnot, and you've moved on to certain things in your life. If they did a reality show on becoming an astronaut, would you jump at it? Heck yeah. yeah. Right. I, I, I talked to my husband first, but I'd be like, yes. Right. I, I, I would love I would love to see, to really see that, too. Like, that, could, that would be dope. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah. Um, research on you and some of your accomplishments. We found that via your Wikipedia page, and yes, folks, she has a Wikipedia, okay, um, that from 1994 to 2017, you've been on about 18 assignments while in the service. Which would you say was your most difficult assignment? Most difficult? And was Vladimir Putin there? No. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Not Vladimir Putin. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Most di most difficult assignment. Anything that was de deploy deploying my first when I flew helicopters going to the Middle East that was just so different. Mm. Flying in, in the North Arabian Gulf was different. Um, it was challenging because I was new, but I mean I've flown over Afghanistan, I've flown over Iraq. I mean those are all these have all been great assignments. I was proud to be able to do the mission. I was proud to be part of that that chain of events that occur um the most difficult i think i think flying helicopters um was probably the most difficult that was on one of some of my first training missions i almost got killed um by my <laughs> my my uh aircraft commander and i we made silly mistakes and um uh almost lost an aircraft because he was doing something and didn't, didn't tell me and I didn't know this it was happening at night. You got to read the book for that one. Yes. And and uh, it, it taught me a lot uh, about trusting people and, and making sure things are getting done. So I would say probably the most dangerous flying on the back of the boat in a helicopter. Um, that's probably the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous other than flying a U-2 aircraft coming in at night to land. So... But helicopters on the back of the flying at the back of the ship are difficult. Mm. Okay. Well, why I, in the military service? You want to say something? Oh no, no, no! I was going to say oh. something about Putin, but we'll just keep that oh. for later. No. <laughs> I was going to make I was going to make a joke. I'm not. No, I'm not. There's two things. There's a couple of countries I would never go to. I can't go to Russia. Can't go to China. That you can't go, or I wouldn't go there. Like as a as a YouTube pilot, I mean, it would. I mean, I can go if I wanted to, but I would probably get rolled up and detained for a while. Right. For some, you know, it's one of those things. Yeah, don't, like, don't go. Is your name is your name on a list that? <laughs> I don't think my name's on a list, but I will tell you. So um, when I started flying U-2s, I went to South Korea, right? So my first missions, I was flying South Korea. There was an article on me written, I think about a month later, that was written in uh, Mandarin or Cantonese about me. And I was like, they know who I am. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be going to China anytime soon. <laughs> That's crazy. What do you think about that? Um, I don't know if you heard about this, that, that soldier that like ran into North Korea. like. He um, uh, yes, uh, the black soldier that, uh, uh, ran because he, I forgot what he did. Yeah. Look, I, 
for those who have ever been in South Korea and, is, and have done the DMZ tour, so if you've ever done, I would recommend it highly. It, you learn a lot if they still do it, but I did the DMZ tour there. Um, there is, uh, yeah, that's not a country I would just run to. Even if I was scared, I would rather take a boat out into the middle of the sea in the opposite direction than run into North Korea. Like, it's... There's a lot. Oh, <laughs> no. Why? <laughs> I mean, they, I, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of not good things going on there. And it's just eerie. The, the DMZ, I think, I believe is 50 miles. It's very quiet. You know, there's a lot of traps out there and, you know, you hear the, the sound, the call to bring you over to North Korea. No, no, thank you. They're one of the most isolated, isolated countries. You fly overhead it is bright lights in South Korea and it's pitch black at nighttime in North Korea. Mm. Pitch black. Well, like, ain't got nothing going on right, right now. And I know. Oh, so you, you, so you've flown over North Korea. No, no, <laughs> no, I, I've been by, <laughs> by there. I'm sorry. Don't come have been by there. I've been by there, maybe. In the area. I mean, in the area. I never went over. I'm just, you could, I could see, for, I'm, I'm flying above, I'm flying above 70,000 feet. I can see a lot of things. All I know is light in South Korea, total pitch blackness in North Korea. <laughs> well, Meryl, while you were in the military service, you were awarded a plethora of awards, honors, and medals for your accomplishments. What was your most proud accomplishment that you will never forget? And when did you realize that you were that you were truly on the path to success while serving? Man, um, for award wise, I mean, I love. I mean, I have an air medal um, just for flying missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I have over three hundred combat hours out there, so I'm really proud about that. Um, wow. When did I know that I was on the path? I mean, just joining the military. I never. To me, joining the military is something that I'm proud of because I, I got to, to, you know, defend my country. And a lot of people um, maybe do or do not want to do that. That's their whole thing. But I'm, I'm proud I was able to do it and also, you know, live my dream, do flying, do all that stuff. So for me, it's proud. I think my proudest moments... Um, any award that I got for doing command and leadership, um, I enjoy it. I love running groups of people. I love leading people. I learn a lot as a leader. I make mistakes as a leader and I enjoy, I enjoy every bit of that. I enjoy, especially now more than ever, making people better versions of themselves and watching them grow. That, that like warms my heart a lot. Like, I love flying. I love all that. But as I get older, to be able to pass that down, I think is amazing. And I, it's a gift that I'm glad I'm able to do. I saw this video of you um, with a bunch of young girls. Um, and they, you were asking them, um, like, why are they here? And they're like, um, to fly. I think they said to fly a plane. You're like, duh. But it, 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 was, so, it was so cute that you know, I think it's really important to show, especially young women, um, young girls, anyone really, but especially young women or young girls, like I said, um, to show them a person like you. Um, because, you know, we have, like you said, you're just getting into the whole internet world, but the things we see on social media, it's like, what the hell? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, there's some crazy, yeah. there's some, there's some crazy stuff going on. But I, I, I want to be that positive in, influence because I think, especially in underserved communities, yeah. look, we outsource a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like we got call centers and all these things that are overseas, and there's, and this is nothing wrong with that. But I, I get upset with companies, um, like Google, like Facebook, like all these companies. We have this. Underserved community, whether you pick New York, California, Ohio, wherever, all these kids that are going down some other path and you're telling me that we can't go there, we can't 
teach them STEM. We can't teach them certain things. We can't figure out who has like mathematical, um, not uh, talents. We can't go in and find a talent pool of kids and pull these kids out and give them some great education. You, I, I don't believe you. Like we have, we have companies that have, you know, more money than most countries out there. And these companies cannot invest in here. So I get, I get really upset about that. I'm with you. And I'm with you. I, you know, America is like 30th in education. That to me is the problem. You know what I mean? So the fact that, like you said, why can't we go and find, we need to be beefing up this country more in education more now than ever, I feel like. You know, especially right. AI come in and all this stuff coming along. We are, okay, I know people say I like to conspiracy or whatever. We are in danger, all right? We're in danger, and our, the kids that are coming, they, they're not being taught things. And I'm scared, because as I get older, I want to be taken care of. I don't want to have to be <laughs> doing all this shit. Okay? Listen. I need my kids smarter. But, um... Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that that statement. I really do. Um, but Meryl, uh, while being in service, um, we are sure you've seen a lot, and as you said and spoke about, and it's in your book, Shatter the Sky. Um, you've seen a lot and experienced a lot um, of wars and seeing violence. What are your thoughts on the senseless crime and violence here in America, especially when it comes to law enforcement and the shootings that have been happening involving, involving the Black community. Also, do you own a gun, and how do you feel about gun ownership? <laughs> Compact question. That, oh, that's a lot of questions. All right, so, I, you know, I'll be honest. Um, I'm a military person, so you know my gun status. Ooh. We ain't even messing around. I'll be honest with, wait, with you. Wait, before we... What's your favorite? Um, three fifty seven revolver. Well, you know, he's a gun. He's a gun connoisseur. That's why we asked. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. I'm not. Sure. Well, I wasn't sure. Some people get really, they get really like uptight about it. So, no, <laughs> so what's that? Like my pew pews. Oh, yeah. So. But but I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends that don't, you know, they don't live by that. They don't like it at all. But, you know, in the military, we shoot guns and we shoot other things and we, you know, we we have weapons. So I like the, I like the 357 just because they you can carry 38 special as well as the 357. So I like to do the 38 specials with uh, the 38 caliber to practice. It, it's fun. Um, when I lived in Colorado, uh, I you know, I used to have a CCW and all that stuff. Uh, my husband and I, you know, we, we'd go shoot. I think you should be proficient. Um, you, you need to be proficient and understand those things. Um, in the CCW, to answer your other question, which is going to be um, police. Look, I know, I know a few police officers, military and law enforcement. We have a lot in common, right? We like to do service for self. I've really, I'm even going to talk about it in one of my speeches, how a cop actually convinced me to go to the Navy. And his name was, no, I kid you not, his name was Officer Bacon. That was his last <laughs> name. And he was a great guy and he was really cool. And I have a lot of respect for officers and I understand the pressures and the things that they're under. Yeah. And um, one of my questions is like in the military, when we go overseas and we deploy, we typically deploy for, we typically deploy for three years and then we go to shore duty. And I always wonder why police officers didn't do the beat or go out on the line for three, three years and then come back and do desk jobs or do something else that was less stressful. Mm. Cause you have to see that there are people that are, if you're at this heightened s state all the time you have sort of this traumatic thing and then you think a neighborhood or a group of people are a certain way and you're going to act accordingly. We all know that when we've seen Abu Ghraib and we've seen other areas, after a while, when you're in a position of authority over people, you tend to treat them less than. Right. And that's not a good thing. And psychologically, we know that happens. 
So yeah. how can we avoid that? How can we have law enforcement not get into those situations? Yes, there's training. There's also downtime that needs to happen. There's also, and this is just my opinion. I'm not in law enforcement. I'm just talking as a military person. Um, and there also has to be more mentoring with the neighborhood. Like how many cops talk to people in the neighborhood? I mean, I talk to Officer Bacon all the time. He wasn't a threat to me. He carried a gun. If there were kids that were bad, he would see me. He would talk to me first before doing anything else. I don't understand because I'm not in that why there's not more of that. That's what I saw growing up. And that's why I have the opinion that I have. Right. What happened in the last 30 years that all of that has broken down? Is it money? Is it training? Is it other other? I, I don't know. So that's where I'm at. I, I ask a lot of questions. Right. Um, there's a lot of violence. And there's a lot of violence on both sides, and I get it, but I, I think we can bridge that gap. Someone said their program. Okay. Uh, um, we can bridge that gap, but there has to be effort on both sides to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I like said about because you know, I think that what what gets muddled, especially in the media, um, when you talk about like defund the police and whatnot those kind of things that you were talking about, about why is it that you, you know, in the military, you do three years and then you get off, and you, you know, you go and do something else that can probably, you know, calm you down. And I, and I, I do say a lot, and we talked about this off, off yes. uh, the show about how police are, you know, underpaid, overstressed, you know, I'm not excusing anything that happens at all. Right. Um, but, these are people who, like I said, are underpaid and overstressed. That's that sucks for everyone. And I don't know why police aren't paid more. I don't know why they have to work. Like I was, I was talking to a cop, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm doing a um a 19 hour shift," and I'm like, "That's fucking nuts." Like if you were, were you know, even Walmart says, "Go to lunch, clock out." Um, you know what I mean? Everywhere else, but handling a gun. And and being patrolling is like, oh well, you know, keep doing it. And I just don't understand. So, yeah, so I'll put I'll put it in perspective. When I left my sea tour, my first tour in the Navy, it was I I trained for a year and then I did three years. So I did two sea tours. So I went to the Middle East the first time and then I went to South America. By the time I was done with all that, I will tell you. It took me about a year to see how much I had changed in that mm. time. And when I mean changed, just based on the stress level, the competitiveness, the flying the aircraft, I was kind of an angry person. I was kind of an a-hole um, quite a bit. And it took me a couple of months to kind of decompress and get back to center. Um, and it took me like music and it took me working out because I gained weight because you don't have enough time because you're deploying. So um, I can only imagine that like fivefold if you're law enforcement and you really have no outlet. So I, I can only tell you that how I felt as a military person and I got back to center, but some people may not have that opportunity. Yeah. So um, that's, that's what, you know, everything that's going on, there's some jacked up stuff happening. Uh, strange mind, dark heart, you know, you send stuff and I watch it and I'm disgusted by yeah. it. But there has to be, you know, law enforcement underpaid, teachers way underpaid. Let's let's go. The let's, education let's, system is disgusting. So I have my family yeah. of educators, and yeah, the way that teachers are treated, the way that they're paid, uh, it's 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 sad. Yeah. 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 We we have to do something. Something has to change at some point because we're just going down. It's the end times, as as Butter would say. Listen, my yes. grandmother would say we are in our last days, but that's you know, I I think there's I think there's hope because I think there are a lot of people out there that want that change, and I think the voices that are screaming are starting to come up a little bit because other people are there are a whole bunch of other stuff going on that are distracting them so i think if i don't know i'm just gonna i'm gonna keep talking i'm gonna keep pushing i'm gonna keep using my platform and 
you know, I'm a I'm a uh, a board member with a local community college here for the foundation board member. So if I can leverage that, if I can network, I'm working on some other irons in the fire to um, work with young people. So I'm going to do my part and I'm going to keep doing it. And everyone else, if it's doom and gloom, fine. I'm going to keep doing it to the end of days. Um, I'm always going to have hope. I'm always going to have hope for kids. I'm going to have hope for everyone to that we can get back on track. Yeah, we. we I, I feel like we have to always keep fighting no matter what. Yeah, yeah well, always. Meryl, you are the true definition of an alpha woman. Not only are you a veteran and Arthur, but you're also a motivational speaker. How did you get into that and how important is it uh, for you to inspire others? Yeah, I got into that. After I, I was doing motivational speaking once I retired. Mm -hmm. um, once Tough as Nails aired, uh, um, okay, someone in the DARE program. Okay, I, I have to look that one up. Um, once I finished Tough as Nails, actually, Phil Kogan, who's the host of The Amazing Race, is the executive producer for Tough as Nails. Um, we had a discussion and I got aligned with a speaking agent, which was great for Harry Walker Speaking Agency. So I do, I do speaking. I do. I talked for. I've talked at places like Meta. I've talked at Ooh. Dell Technologies. I've talked at a lot of places. I've talked at the local elementary school. So I believe it's very important because I bring a skill set of leadership. I bring a skill set of the kid from the Bronx as a mom as someone who's competed, as someone who's flown aircraft from helicopters to high altitude. So I have a lot of insight. I always tell like U2s fly twice as high as any commercial airliner. My perspective is such that it's just very high level. And I can get into the weeds with you, but <laughs> you looking up you looking up there? I'm like twice as high. What the right. Hell? That's what I was I was literally thinking like what lower? How high? Like yeah, you, is there oxygen? You start seeing that you uh, not a lot. We have to be in a full pressure suit. That's why I have that like NASA space suit. It's the same, same similar suit. But um, it's uh, you see the curvature of the Earth. You see stars that are limitless. So, so the Earth is, is curving. It's curving. It is not flat. Okay, let's dispel the rumor right here on the Pink Club, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> The Earth is is so it's round. You see the curvature of the Earth. Well, listen, uh, Meryl, uh, I want to thank you so much because you you know when uh, Strange Mind Noli and she came and she said I have so many people and she said that that she had a spy. I said what the fuck, you know? <laughs> excuse me, um, but really no, I did because I'm like a spy. Now how do we speak to a spy? He was um, so dead on. We have to reach out. We have to reach out. We have to reach out. Well, you glad we did. You didn't ask me any spy stuff, but uh, I'll I'm, tell you a little bit. No, I'm, I didn't know like what to really because it's like what what the what, what all right. Yeah. I'm I, I'll help you out. So the U two right? So the U two is a high altitude reconnaissance. It does intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance reconnaissance ISR. It also does signals intelligence. So I always tell, especially for kids at school, I say signals intelligence. Any type of signal. Any wavelength. 5G. The U2. The U2 is like a big receiver of that. And it takes it and it offloads it to people who analyze it. And so, they were like, signals, any signals. I'm like, any signals. They're like, phones? I'm like, is it a signal? And they go, they all stop and look. <laughs> and then all the hands go up and like, do they do this and that? And I'm like, no. The U.S. does not, as a YouTube pilot, we don't spy on the U.S., right? So we don't do that. It's illegal. I'm serious. It is. You look. <laughs> serious. We don't. At least not. Because, listen, I was up here. Like I, can't, I can't talk about any other government organization. I will tell you in the YouTube community, we don't do any of that. But, oh, okay. there are some over here. That are I'm just saying. The Patriot does allow. <laughs> I'm really going to start to reevalu reevaluate some conversations that I have. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. If you if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't got to worry about it. Right. right. I mean, 
Okay, so okay, so all these ring cameras and all that, you know. Yeah. So was that was the ring was the ring camera developed by the U.S. government? Do you know? Oh, I don't know. I just know I don't have one, and I don't have an Alexa in my house. Okay. Because you, have, you want one, or because you know better? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I got some redecorating to do. <laughs> okay, what do you think about um, AI and that whole, what do you think about that kind of stuff, like, coming? Yeah, so I, I think AI is here. I think AI is, look, I, I think AI is a great tool to up your level of things that you're doing. What I don't like about AI is that people are using it as a crutch. It's like, use it to up your game. Use it to, you know, you're you're working on a post or something and you want to think of different words, but don't use it as, like that lawyer who got in trouble for using AI to help him do a law case. Like, come on, fool. You went to school for like seven years and you're going to just well. press the I believe button. Like, it's... <laughs> Um, my friend Ryan is like, that's why, let's just say cover all the, the, um, cameras on your phone. Facts. Why? Um, because I, I mean, from a hacker standpoint, hackers can reverse that and look into your camera. I've been, I remember, I remember years ago, probably back in the, back in the, late 90s early 2000s a friend of mine she saw my laptop she laughed at me she's like why are you taping up your camera i go because they people can see you and not know she was like no they can't and this is before i even got into the youtube program i'm just telling you as someone who was on computers and that was that was no. a long time ago so imagine what the mm. what's going on oh, i feel like oh, yeah what i feel like there is a person there are people out there who like subscribe to certain channels, like say I have a camera in my house and they just get to watch me. Like it's like a part of their popcorn. Oh, he's doing like true. Like the black whale like somewhere. It, what? Hold on. Dude, I, I love it because even as a, you know, I did electrical engineering and one of my favorite was assembly program. Like I love this stuff. And back in the eighties and nineties, I was like, the, the stuff that was happening Mm-hmm. And now, nope. <laughs> Strange mindset. I just showed everyone. Hey, my tatas. My tatas. Hey, uh, protected tatas. <laughs> Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It is. It is. Um, and she actually said earlier, um, you have balls so big that you wear them on your chest, which I said was funny. Um, oh. <laughs> I never heard it that way. I was like, wow. I'm going to steal that. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, she did She did ask about aliens. Um, oh, okay. did you see one? No, I, you know, I've, I personally, the, the um, coolest thing I've ever had is a shooting star go across my aircraft. Like, it looked like it went underneath my aircraft at the time. So that was the coolest thing I've seen. I've never seen any aliens. I've flown over Area 51. Yeah, I mean, you can fly. You can fly over it. I've flown over it. Oh. Wait, so you've been in America flying around just on your lunch? Like, you just go and... Well, we do do training missions, but we don't... We don't carry cameras or anything like that. We just go. We just fly. But that particular day I was doing... um, I worked at Palmdale. Mm -hmm. So we were testing equipment. And so, with permission, we're able to go to certain areas and test. So that's what I did. And see, the wording, it's all about the wording, ladies and gentlemen. Because, okay. okay, <laughs> never mind. Um, that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. You are very intentional. I, I like it. Yeah. Can I ask you, um, <laughs> can I ask you, okay, I don't want to know the city. What state do you live in? Because if everything goes to shit, I want to be able to come. <laughs> no, you don't want you don't want to come here. Um, I live in California, oh. so I <laughs> you don't want to come here. Never mind. Yeah, see. <laughs> well, Meryl, um, 
I, I do want to thank you so much for coming um, on the show. I really appreciate you, and I know Brother does as well. Yes. Um, before you go, can you tell us what you have coming up or going on and how to stay updated with you? When I, okay. okay, so you can stay updated with me here on Instagram or on my website, MerylTangestall.com. Uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook. It just takes me forever to answer because it's so old and I, I can't. I can't with it. Like, <laughs> um, What am I doing now? I am still doing speaking engagements. Um, next week, I have some locally. Um, my next one will be, my next one where I'm out of state will be, actually, in November, I will be back in New York. I'm going to be talking to 950 Kev on his talk show in the Bronx in City Island. We're going to go, I'm going to meet him out in City Island. City Island? Huh? I said I love City Island. Yes, yeah, great place. So I'm going to go there. I'm going to probably try to talk in a couple schools. And then starting in January, I'll be in Nashville, Tennessee at a veterans organization. That'll be the follow. And then in March, I will be out at the National Business Aviation Association meeting in Dallas, Texas. So I'm all over. Come so on. stay tuned Dallas? on Instagram. No doubt. Yes. Dallas, okay. Texas. Make sure you get some good fish while you're on City Island. Cause Oh man, I missed it. Y'all. So I'm I'm excited. I'm looking forward to going back home to seeing some people, seeing a little bit of family, visiting my mom's uh, gravesite. So it'll be all good. Are you gonna check out like your old neighborhood? Like that's like a thing for me always. I always do. I always go back. I got I check it for a moment, and um, and I'm just grateful for where I started and where I am now. So yeah, I take a moment of being grateful. And on that. I know. Thank you, Meryl. Uh, thank you, Meryl. So much. We appreciate you. And listen, thank you oh, for thank your you service. For uh, yeah. thank, thank you for the support, and thank you for being you. We got we got to keep in touch. Yeah. I love you guys. Uh, love, we love you too. Thank you for coming through. Yes. Hey, if I'm going to the Bronx, we gonna go shooting? Yeah. I mean, I'm in Georgia. I'm in gun. I'm in gun gunland. So okay. So when I'm in Georgia, I'm gonna let you know, and we are gonna go. Please, I, I I got a shoddy. I got my rifle. Let's let's do it. <laughs> What's your everyday carry, real quick? My everyday, uh, I don't carry Cal. I mean, I don't carry nothing in California. They are kind of crazy with their laws over here. Oh. Meryl, he take his gun everywhere he go. No, in Georgia. Everywhere. I'm peaceful. I mean, I'm just don't come in my. I'm peaceful too. I just I don't trust these motherfuckers. <laughs> just don't come in my house uninvited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Meryl. Um, well, thank you for coming. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. She said I'm peaceful. <laughs> Listen, that was super dope. Are we talked to a duper dope. I don't, know. I don't think these I mean let me not say that but no one you know no just say these other shows they, they, don't, they haven't had a spy ain't nobody had a spy we had a spy it was, a super duper dope. It was so um, inspiring to talk to her um, and just to talk about all she's accomplished and all she has done yeah. it was super exciting okay but are you ready to get into our next segment I am. we gotta get um johnny up here so we can introduce him and we can get into our favorite segment what will we do thank you strange thank you so much yeah I do love her thank you strange i ain't calling her strange <laughs> like she's not strange at all i mean in a sense she's strange i'm gonna start calling her hard I, well i call her Nobi, but um yeah. <laughs> I what the can't. Fuck? I love her so much she won't leave her husband for me. She's crazy. <laughs> I think there's a reason why. <laughs> uh, she, she should not. I mean, you should have asked her if she's a swinger. How about we're not going to ask last her that. <laughs> she's 
Go ahead, everything else. 